I don't know about you guys, but I've always noticed a big difference between the quality of the parts us hobbyists can produce versus the quality of what mass production parts can achieve with expensive molding and casting techniques. It's like you can have one or two almost as good strengths in a budget manufacturing process, but it never even comes close to something you'd buy in the store. Take FDM 3D printing for example. The shape and color of your parts can be just about whatever you want. But the layer lines ruin aesthetics and durability. Plus, the stronger the filament, the harder it is to print. Another example, resin 3D prints. They win in part quality, but start turning into jelly at like 55 degrees and are usually too weak otherwise for practical applications. And don't even get me started on the limitations of CNC milling and sheet metal if plastics won't do it for you. But after getting some parts manufactured for my next project using a new process that melts powder instead of filament or resin, I'm starting to believe otherwise because printing this way instead ticks just about every box and it's not expensive either. So how does it work? What are its advantages and how can you design and order parts using this process? Stick around to find out. First, a thin layer of powder between 20 and 120 microns, depending on the material and machine, is spread evenly across the printing bed. Then, the appropriate 2D slice of the 3D model at that height is formed within this new layer, using inkjet agents that precisely direct energy from an infrared light source in multi-jet fusion and high-powered lasers within an inert atmosphere that helps to reduce impurities and porosity within the part in selective laser melting. This is repeated layer by layer until the fused part is complete so that excess powder can be removed for reuse and the part can be separated from the build plate for further processing. Compared to other additive manufacturing methods suitable for prototyping, MJF parts most commonly printed with PA12 nylon enjoy superior part quality and consistency, near isotropic strength, long-term performance, low density, high operating temperatures, small base costs, and low minimum order quantities, no requirement for supports, and real-world impact strength at least comparable to, but sometimes even exceeding that, of engineering filaments printed with FDM in lab tests. There are still some disadvantages to consider though. Firstly, even though FJM parts can achieve IP67 if you design them right, which is enough to hold off leaks when submerged a meter deep in water for 30 minutes, that's the most you can expect since porosity prevents complete waterproofing. For outdoor applications where the part gets rained on, this is still more than enough though. On the topic of environmental resistance, just like many other plastics, PA12 does burn slowly without flame retardant additives which the standard variant used in MJF has none of. And UV resistance isn't the greatest. It's better than ABS and resin, but worse than ASA. So many years in the sun can cause brittleness that can sometimes impact the function of your part. Now there are flame retardant and even higher surface finish quality variants of PA12 that HP offer, as well as bio-based PA11 and other types of plastics including flexible ones. But these might not always be as available and accessible at the manufacturer that you choose, so I've decided not to cover them in this video, especially since SLS can work instead in many cases. When designing parts to use the MJF process, the most notable requirement is making sure unsintered powder can be removed from any internal cavity, which means things like infill patterns and a hollow sphere are impossible to print. Your part gets manufactured as is. As an alternative, if you want to save weight, you can design open lattice structures into your 3D file before manufacturing. Or if you really need enclosed info patterns, you can design them in yourself and add holes to drain the powder that can be sealed after. Just make sure openings are big enough for this to work. Aside from that, you can apply similar design guidelines as you would with FDM for large flat sections, thicknesses, clearances, tolerances, and so on minus those associated with mitigating layer line weakness as a conservative way to get a good quality part. I know I'll certainly be using MJF from now on for functional indoor and outdoor parts as well as things like brackets and housings for my electronics projects. I need to redo this casing for my next project that I messed up. What an absolutely horrible shape. But anyways, let me know what other applications you can think of in the comments down below. 
Before we discuss the topic of SLM just like we did with MJF, I think it's important to first answer the question, how did I get all these 3D printed parts using advanced technologies as a hobbyist? And the answer is through this channel sponsor, PCBWay, who are currently running sales of up to 50% off on their various manufacturing services. All you have to do is register an account using the link in my description to get $5 off your first order and help support the channel if you don't have one already, and then head over to the 3D printing services page. Upload your file and select your desired material and manufacturing process, and your sales rep will give you a quote for the part shortly. In my case, these two banshees are only about $15 and $35 each, which is incredibly affordable given the fact that the machines used to make them are tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars, and manufacturing only took a week. PCBWay also offers CNC machining, laser cutting, which I used for these tiny display windows, vacuum casting, and PCB services of course, so if you want to take your project to the next level, consider them your one-stop shop for your manufacturing needs. Now you might be wondering, when should I get my metal parts manufactured with SLM instead of CNC? And that's a good question because it's in no way a direct replacement. If you're someone with access to software that lets you generate these lattice structures, SLM could end up being super useful for you in weight-constrained applications. With more complex parts like this heatsink, SLM can be cheaper than CNC in many cases, since what takes CNC two or three passes and precise alignment to do can take SLM one pass with minimal post-processing. And in parts like NASA fabric, this benchy, titanium implants, blocks with internal cooling channels, and more, SLM can sometimes be your only choice that allows that geometry to be made, since small bridges of up to a few millimeters depending on the material and overhangs of up to 45 degrees are possible. For larger holes, steeper overhangs, or longer bridges, PCBWay will make the necessary modifications before sending your file to the SLM machine and then post-process it after so it's within tolerances. These modifications might include supports, and it could seem a bit strange that they're used in SLM but not MJF despite them being similar processes on the surface level, but the supports aren't actually for keeping the layers from sagging down. The powder underneath is sufficient. It's to make sure they cool and shrink evenly to prevent warping and have a solid anchor to the build plate. It's for this same reason that SLM prints always start on the printing bed and need to be cut off with a wire EDM after, whereas MJF prints can start wherever. Both use heated powder beds, but the temperature gradients involved in SLM are a lot more extreme. One study with 17 parts in each group, both groups having been polished to the same surface roughness, showed SLM titanium alloy parts having significantly higher static strength characteristics than CNC parts out of the same titanium alloy in the short term yet significantly worse fatigue performance over many bending cycles, showing that residual thermal stresses, porosity, and unsintered powder can potentially limit the durability of SLM parts over time. Other general disadvantages with SLM include rough tolerances, a coarse surface finish off the machine, and a limited material selection. But for many applications, these aren't deal breakers, and the benefits in cost and flexibility are worth it. In terms of design guidelines, the most notable aspects are making sure supports are minimized, or if supports are used, that they can be removed at the factory. Unsintered powder is able to escape from inside your part, and wall thickness is no smaller than 1mm. But ultimately, what's viable to print in SLM and what will require supports is based on many different factors. So if you've designed a part and you're unsure whether it can be manufactured with SLM after doing your own checks and research, Go ahead and upload your part to PCBWay's online ordering service anyways. It's free, it's super easy to use, and your sales rep will let you know if there are any issues so you can update your design. Now, with that being said, I hope you enjoyed this video and it provided you some value, and thanks for staying this long. It's literally starting to rain just as I'm stopping the recording. Anyways, this video took a good bit of research, so if you want to support my channel and see my future electronics projects, make sure to subscribe and comment down below what I could improve for my future videos. Thanks.